Let's talk about continuous wave Doppler. As you recall from our earlier lectures, that the transducer typically handles both transmission and receiver. But in the continuous wave Doppler, you have a separate transducer and receiver, as indicated in the diagram. The continuous wave Doppler is the earliest and simplest system available. You have a continuous wave transmitter or oscillator feeding a signal through the transmitter. The returning signal will come back and will be amplified and mixed with this original oscillator's transmitter signal through a mixer, which in effect multiplies the signals into a product. And you have the resulting signal, which subsequently is fed through a demodulator and a wall filter. And you end up having the low signal Doppler, which uh, results outside of the wall filter. In review, you have the transmitter frequency and the receiver frequency multiplied together, giving a sum of the two and also the difference of the two. The demodulator gives you only the difference. In review, the transmitted signal F of T from the transducer is mixed with the returning echo signal S of R, yielding both the sum and difference. The filter signal via low pass wall filter, F R minus F T in effect is the Doppler signal. The wall filter adjusts this low frequency cutoff value. Recall that the Doppler shift frequency is typically in the audio range, less than 10,000 Hz. Therefore, in comparison to the transmitter frequency, which is typically greater than 1 MHz, the difference is very small. Therefore, the receive frequency is practically the same as the transmitter frequency. Some examples of continuous Doppler, fetal heart tone Doppler, speed gun, and cardiac specific continuous wave systems. Let's talk about some of the advantages of continuous Doppler. Accurate measurement of reflective velocities. There's no damping, therefore you have higher signal strength. And there's no aliasing. This is an example of a continuous Doppler measurement measuring the velocity of the blood going through the aortic valve. Let's do an example. In Doppler systems, what combination of transmitted and received signals yields the Doppler signal? Is it A? the product of the transmitted and received ultrasound frequencies? Is it B, the sum of the transmitted and receiver frequencies? Is it C, the difference between the transmitted and receiver frequencies? Or is it D, just the received ultrasound frequency? You may pause the video to consider response. The correct answer is C, the difference between the transmitted and receiver ultrasound frequencies. Now let's talk about pulse wave Doppler. It is the most prevalent system used today. It has full duplex capability, meaning you can run B mode and Doppler simultaneously. And it's more flexible than the continuous wave Doppler systems that we just talked about. What are the advantages of pulse Doppler? You can control the axial resolution by varying the pulse length and duration. You can control the, ra the gate range and specify the spatial volume. You can separate the frequency control for both B mode and D mode to your advantage. And the Doppler angle and control can be adjusted. This allows you to operate power Doppler versus regular Doppler appropriately. Let's do an example. What is the advantage of pulse wave Doppler over continuous Doppler? Is it A, pulse wave Doppler has higher signal amplitude than continuous wave? Is it B, pulse wave Doppler is more accurate than continuous wave in calculating high flow velocities? Is it C, pulse wave Doppler does not require damping of the transmitted pulses? Or is it D, pulse wave Doppler has the capability of range discrimination or specification? You may pause the video to consider your response. The correct answer is D, pulse wave Doppler has the capability of range gate control. One of the goals of this lecture is to teach you about nobology. This is a mock-up of a typical ultrasound system with a vanilla layout. You have B mode, you have color mode, which we'll talk about later, you have D for Doppler, and you have M for M mode, and you have the pointer, different buttons to control depth and frequency. For the purposes of Doppler measurement, you want to first start off with B mode, followed by activation or superposition of the D the Doppler mode. Let's talk about the Doppler detection circuitry. Over the years, there have been multiple implementation, such as sideband filtering, offset carry demodulation, time domain correlation, which gained some steam at one point in time, 
and finally in-phase quadrature demodulation. For all practical purposes, you just have to know about the in-phase quadrature demodulation, because that's what's being used today. The pole stoppler detector circuitry is similar to the continuous waves circuitry that we showed you earlier, with the exception of a sample on hold, quadrature, and the FFT. Let's talk a little bit about the sample on hold. As the name suggests, you're basically sampling the analog signal and building up the signal inside a hole circuitry. As the blood cells reflect the velocities back to the, the signal, uh, back to the transducer into the detection system, you gradually build up the digital signal as indicated by the green arrows. As the signals are built up during each sampling period, they are digitized and converted uh, via smoothing into a filtered Doppler signal. This in turn, the output from the sample on hold, will get fed into the interface quadrature, which is a diagram schematically like this. In effect, what it does is it tells you which direction the Doppler signal is coming out of. Is it towards or away? And finally, after digitizing from analog to digital, it is fed into a Fourier fast transform circuit. And this will lead to this discussion on Fourier analysis. Fourier analysis basically take all periodic signals and expand it into trigonometric functions. This conversion is, is done going from time to frequency domain, and it works even on non-periodic signals. Specifically, fast Fourier transform or discrete Fourier transform are used in the real world. The signals are sampled, which is a big difference versus continual wave systems. Now, for sampling, if it's undersampled, you can cause aliasing, which we'll talk about later. Let's dive into the question to test your knowledge. If the frequency of the transmitted pulse is 4 MHz, which of the following most closely approximates the frequency of the received signal? Is it A, 5 MHz? Is it B, 4 MHz? Is it C, 400 kHz? Or is it D, 40 kHz? You may pause the video to consider response. The correct answer is B, 4 MHz. As we talked about earlier, the transmitted and the received frequencies are very close in the Doppler system. Let's dive into the meat of the Doppler spectral analysis. It takes a one-dimensional data stream and convert it into a three-dimensional spectra. The horizontal axis denotes time, the vertical axis denotes the beat frequency or flow velocity of the red cells, and the brightness is the third dimension which denotes the intensity of the reflected echo. If you take this uh, amplitude versus time signal coming out of the um, the quadrature, uh, you have a sample data of the amplitude that's fed to the FFT or the DFT, and in turn you get an amplitude versus frequency to convert from time to frequency domain. And if you take this frequency domain data set and convert that further, you get frequency versus time, which is what's displayed in the Doppler and ultrasound system. So this is the ultimate Doppler signal that you see. In this case, you have the breaker artery giving you the pulsatile Doppler signal, where you have the range gate, as I mentioned, fitted inside the vessel. And you have the 1D uh, section uh, cutting across the anatomy, yielding this three-dimensional spectral window. A spectral window has a specific definition. It is the area under the peak of the spectral trace, which is that empty area as seen here. Now, in the, in the y-axis, you have the velocity. Now, the velocity comes straight out of the Doppler equation. F of d, the Doppler shift, is 2 times velocity over the speed of sound times the source frequency times the Doppler angle term. So this v corresponds to the v that's, that is plotted in the chart. Now, specifically, you have the, again, amplitude versus time signal. You divide up into 10 to 20 millisecond chunks and analyze one after the other. So you have these one-dimensional segments and you sample these signals at a rate of 20 kilohertz up to 1 megahertz. And if you're operating at say 20 kilohertz at the maximum Nyquist frequency you get 10,000 samples per second. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about aliasing. Now at maximum Nyquist frequency getting the 10,000 samples per second over the 10 millisecond range, you get 100 samples in the frequency time domain. So you have 10 milliseconds 
segment that you analyze, and that corresponds to one segment of the frequency versus time Doppler signal. Now the spectra is made up of these vertical segments, which corresponds from the frequency to the time domain, as illustrated by this arrow. Therefore, each 10 millisecond segment yields a spectra of approximately 100 points, depending on the sampling frequency. And as you go from the green segment to the, the red or the second segment, you get the next spectra, which is shown in the frequency time plot. So therefore, the final Doppler spectral plot consists of a collection of sample spectra of, say, 100 points. So this one-dimensional presentation becomes two-dimension, as shown in the frequency time plot. And upon conversion uh, for of subsequent segments, you get the entire spectra 